<laughs> well, you know, I lived in South Texas, it was on the Gulf Coast. This one has palm leaves on it. Of course, it also has golf stuff, which I tried to tuck in. Um, there was a PGA course uh, where I lived there. Uh, uh, it was Padre Island, but then off of Corpus Christi, there was a PGA course. Got to plan it once for a fundraiser. I'm not going to tell you how many balls I lost into Corpus Christi Bay. <laughs> Being the kind of golfer I was, I had some spares, some dirty balls. But anyhow, uh, that, that's just an aside. Uh, but it is Palm Sunday today. Uh, it, so the triumphal entry, um, you know, these are stories that as Christians, you know, we, we know uh, and, and we learn about. And amazingly, every time I approach these things, I, I learn new things. Um, part of the context, you know, we mentioned uh, the last time we, uh, we were really deep in Matthew was uh, Jesus was just coming down from the north and he'd healed blind men uh, up north uh, in, in a little region north of Jerusalem and um, he, he then came down to Bethany and Bethphage and his next major action after this entry is going to be the cleansing of the temple. I think that's kind of important. But what I want to start out with is the fact that all of this was foretold. In Matthew 21, verses 1 and 3, it says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you at once, and you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. So, um, we have Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Is the map the next slide? So just to give you an idea of where we're at, if you can't read this, on the far end is Bethany. This red is his path leading into Jerusalem. So Bethphage and the Mount of Olives is that second spot right there. And as we go past, right there at the edge, before he gets to the river valley, is the Garden of Gethsemane, and then straight into the temple. Uh, and then on the other side here, if you can see where Jerusalem's at, directly above that is Golgotha, the Hill of the Skull, where the crucifixion will take place. And I'll point out one other thing. Right south of the temple is Gion, the spring that, uh, that fed Jerusalem when they were under siege. And, and that'll become important later. But all of these events take place if you were to um, put a tack in the temple and do a radius around it less than a mile and a mile and a half radius around the temple. Everything that happens within that last week that we really focus on. So he, he's coming in from the Mount of Olives and Jesus sends two. Our account says that he sends two of the disciples. Um, and, and he told them what would happen. And, and that's important. That's true of almost every event that we run into today. Um, he told them what would happen either during his earthly ministry or through the prophets that he sent in the millennia, in the centuries prior. Because when you realize that Jesus is God, he sent those prophets. Um, so he told them a few things. He said, you'll find a donkey and you'll find her colt. He also told them that if you're asked, if somebody asks you what you're doing when you take them, you've got an explanation. The explanation is, I, Jesus, have needed them. And then he said this, and he will send them. And he'll send them right away. So you can assume that there's going to be somebody asked. So as I was reading this, there's a couple of questions that naturally come to mind. Well, who are the two disciples that he sent? And the fact is we're not told here. The other question, you know, that I have is, well, who, who's this man that, that might ask them why they're taking the donkey, why they're taking this colt? Um, you know, is this a prophet? Is this somebody that God has revealed it to that, that this is going to happen, so he's going to say yes. Um, there's no problem. You know, he's received a divine revelation. Is this maybe an angel? We've seen that before. An angel is a messenger, but also a servant. Uh, we know that angels can take human forms, but who, who is this man that's going to allow somebody to just take their donkey and their mule? Or not their mule, their colt. Um, or perhaps maybe this is another disciple, somebody that Jesus has spoken to at another point that, that we don't know about. The fact is we're not told. And the reason we're to not told is it doesn't really matter at this point. There's a point to what's happening. Everything points toward Jesus coming to the fulfillment of his mission. So that's where we're at. So we have this matter of a donkey. We have this, uh, I called it a noble steed. Um, and what was interesting in all of this is I, I 
did a bit of research into some of the Old Testament stuff, and I have the cross-references, I think, up here. Um, but our passage goes on and says this, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So when he talks about the prophet being fulfilled, we often look at Zechariah 9.9, and it says exactly this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that word lowly can mean humble. Um, it can mean a number of things. It's not exactly uh, a good translation in English, but... Um, but that's the reference. So Zechariah foretold this, and then Jesus is fulfilling it. And he, he foretells it to his disciples that he sends, and he says, this is what's going to happen. They bring the donkeys to him. What was surprising to me was I found that this was referred to even earlier. It was referred to back in Genesis. Um, there was a moment where uh, Jacob was, he was close to dying, and he told the people around him, what was going to happen. It comes from Genesis uh, 49, uh, starts in verse 1. It says, Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he whom it to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of all the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, and his robes in the blood of grapes. So he talks about this scepter, this ruler's staff. And we know that Jesus is king, right? That all things have been placed beneath his feet. So this is Jacob speaking all the way back in Genesis for telling something that we see fulfilled 2,000 years ago. The obedience of the nation shall be his. That remains to be fulfilled. It says he will tether his donkey to a vine. And we know from our earlier study that Jesus is the true vine, right? Jesus is the true vine. We're the branches. We're to be plugged into him, and that's how we'll flourish and grow. His colt to the choicest branch, and then it says he will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. So there we have all of the symbolism that we see about this new covenant that is about to emerge within the coming week of Jesus' life and his death. So the donkey, this noble steed. Uh, when you look back through scripture, you find out that donkeys carried prophets, they carried kings. Um, it's all throughout the Bible you hear reference to donkeys. Uh, as a matter of fact, horses were somewhat limited um, in Israel, and it had to do with their slavery to Egypt. In, in Deuteronomy 17, verse 16, this is Moses speaking the law to his people. It says, The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. So when Moses was speaking, Egypt was still on their mind, and he said, Don't go back there, because e Egypt was the place where you got horses, if you were after horses. He said, Don't go back there. And so we don't really see a lot about horses uh, until Solomon's time. And even then, they weren't the, the chosen steed, you know, for the Israelites. Um, you know, under Solomon, he actually, even though he's the one that acquired horses for Israel, he rode into his coronation on David's mule. It wasn't on a horse. We tend to think of the horse as the noble steed, right? But Jesus is riding in on a donkey, and we find this long history of this as a noble steed. Um, and as a matter of fact, that's where I pointed out Gion that spring. That's where uh, Solomon rode in during his coronation, was just up that hill and into the city. And we see Jesus now riding up that hill into the city. So, you know, a donkey was associated more with the idea of industry. It was a working animal, and you live in a hilly country like Israel, you know, rocky. Uh, a donkey is well suited to that. So it was associated with industry, with work. It was also associated with peace and wealth. Now, a horse was also associated with wealth, maybe more so, but also more so with war and with military power. And moreover, we find out that Jesus, he's, he's riding in on a donkey. Can you think of a single time Jesus rode on any animal during his earthly ministry? There's not a single time other than this. The last mile on his way into Jerusalem. And, and so we find out that it's a donkey, and that's important too, because the donkey is purebred. 
Solomon rode in on a mule. So a mule is a product of a donkey and a mare. And it's not purebred. So there's something about this where e even then Jesus' steed was superior to the ones that we see with some of the kings of Israel. Um, and finally, he's making his way up. It's part of the pilgrimage path that many people took, you know, leading to the Passover. And pilgrims, pilgrimage travelers, were expected to arrive on foot. But Jesus did not arrive on foot. And there was great meaning in that. So he receives a royal treatment. Um, coming back to our opening passage, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, <clears throat> placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So this is royal treatment. Uh, I found another passage. Uh, it's when Elisha anointed Jehu, the king over Israel. Uh, and he anointed him, and he gave him a charge to destroy Ahab and Jezebel. You know, they'd embraced all the pagan uh, practices of the Canaanites. Jezebel had been persecuting and killing the prophets. And, and so Jehu is chosen. And Elisha pours oil over his head to anoint him as king. And we've seen that leading up to this, too. We've seen Jesus with his head anointed by, in oil. We've seen his feet washed in perfume and oil. And it says, the men of Israel greeted the news by spreading their cloaks before him. It comes out of Second Kings chapter 9. It says, Jehu said, here is what Elisha told me. This is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. And they quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So that was essentially the coronation of Jehu. And cloaks, when you realize what they were, they were the outer garments. They would protect people from the wind, from sun, from dust, from rain. We could have used some cloaks last night. <laughs> but they were possibly the most valuable garment that someone could own. And, and yet they're throwing them down on the ground for a donkey to walk over. They spread them out so the king's feet wouldn't touch the ground for Jehu. They spread them out so not even the king's steed, not even his feet, would touch the ground. So we have a donkey, this animal that's associated with royal coronations. We have a, a coronation route leading up into the city. We have cloaks arranged for Jesus to sit on. We have them placed on the road. Uh, there, there's one commentator, I opened up one of the commentaries, and he describes it as an improvised red carpet. We, we don't have much that, that relates to that, but the red carpet, you know, you see that, you see that in Hollywood, they think they're royalty, but you see that in Britain when there's a coronation. You see that other places when there's a coronation. And then we have palm branches thrown before him on the route. Uh, there's a passage in Psalm 118, and this is a Messianic psalm. Uh, in verse 26 and 27, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, from the house of the Lord, and this is the covenant name Yahweh, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine on us with bows in hand. Join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So with bows in hand, and that's what we see them casting down these boughs, these palm leaves. Um, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. That phrase is important too. So this is the same psalm that talks about the stone that the builders rejected. We're in the same week as Easter. It's a messianic psalm. And the importance of what Jesus was doing and what they were doing for him couldn't be more clear. The king was entering into the holy city. That's what we celebrate. So they shouted Hosanna. Picking up in verse 9, it says, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So that word Hosanna, go ahead and pull up that next. It comes from the Hebrew. It made, makes it to us in the Greek. I saw everybody looking back. We're only looking at really the second line down. Hosanna. It comes from the Hebrew. That's all you need to know. <laughs> I just thought it was a good visual illustration. But it means help or, or save, I pray. And then it becomes celebration later 
But at the time, they're crying out, help, save us, I pray. Lord, save us. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the other part of Psalm 118. It's 25 and 26, the two verses before. They're crying out help. And what it is, is they desire deliverance from this Roman occupation. They've been under occupation, whether it was the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, and then the Romans. They've been under occupation on again, off again, throughout most of their history. And they cry out to him as son of David. And that's a messianic title. When they say son of David, they knew exactly what they were saying, that it was a messianic title. So put together, Psalm 118, 25 through 27 says, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he made his light to shine on us with bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So there's this big celebration happening, right? They make their way in, and they're casting down cloaks, and they're casting down palm fronds, and they're crying out. And picking up in verse 10, it says, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So we've got all this fervor. It's like a big parade that you don't expect coming into the city. And other people are around and they ask, who is this? And the answer is, it's a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, with all that excitement, you can see where the Jewish leaders, you know, may have been paranoid. Um, they might have thought, well, this is a man who's going to take some of our power. With all this excitement, you might have seen where they were scared, maybe, that there might be a crackdown from the Roman authorities. That's happened before, too. There have been other rebellions, other things that have happened, other people that have raised themselves up as leaders, and there have been crackdowns in the previous century. But their reply is that he's a, a prophet from Nazareth. And I said the prophet from Nazareth, but when you think about it, that might be kind of like saying, well, it's the prophet from Minear, you know? <laughs> yeah, it seems strange, right? But saying that, then you could say, well, that's different than the prophet from Stanford, you know, from Danvers. Um, they might as well have been saying a prophet. And certainly that might have been what they were saying given the way the city was going to treat him just a few days later. They didn't really understand who he was. You know, you kind of wonder, did they just put their hope in this one who was coming up the hill? But they also had the intention of putting their hope in whoever came up the hill next? It's like the idea that, may, well, lightning's going to strike eventually, right? Or, or, or the idea that eventually, you know, if I put in enough numbers, I'm going to win the lottery. So they just put their hope in everybody that comes, but they're not really sure. We, I don't know this for sure. We're not really told. I hope they were sincere, and I hope they weren't the ones who later in the week asked for Barabbas to be released. I hope they weren't the same ones that later in the week mocked him on his way to the cross. But they're crying out Hosanna, and you have to wonder where they were a week later. We don't know. We weren't really told. Because the point is, the king was coming into his city. That's the main point. They're just bit players. And you know, we should celebrate our king, and we need to remember that he was there to sacrifice himself. I said that that, that bit about coming in to place his hands on the horns of the altar was important. Uh, going back to Moses, in Leviticus chapter 8, Moses was anointing the priests. You know, this is Aaron and, and his family, his sons, to be priests at the temple. And this is what he did. So he then presented the bull for the sin offering. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on, his, on its head. Moses slaughtered the bull, took some of the blood, and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar to purify the altar. That's what Jesus is headed to do. That sacrifice was for sin. And Jesus is coming as the sacrifice for sin ready to lay his hands on the horns of the altar. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us with bows in hand, joining the festal procession up to 
the horns of the altar. So the king's making his way into the city. He's making his way to the horns of the altar. And he's there to bring that once and for all final sin offering. It's no wonder that his next, next significant act would be to go in and cleanse the temple. Because after that, the temple is done. So here they are on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and they're proclaiming a king that they don't yet know. They thought him a prophet. But today, we're gathered together, and we can cry out, Hosanna, and we can cry out, save us. But it's become a cry of joy, because we're crying out to a king that we know. We're crying out to a king who is known. A king who has paid the price. A king who died on the cross. A king who rose again. A king who ascended to heaven. A king who sits on his throne. And a king who poured out his spirit. A king who will come again. As we cry out Hosanna this week, we know the king that we proclaimed. That's worth remembering. That's worth celebrating. It's extremely humbling as we step into this week and we look at the cross and then to the resurrection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter into this holy week, may your praises be on our lips. May we cry out Hosanna as a cry of joy, knowing that salvation has come, knowing that it's freely offered, all we have to do is accept you as Lord and Savior. May we be humbled by this week, recognizing that the events of Good Friday, the, the crucifixion, that was for our sins. May we be humbled by this week and remember that you indeed rose again, that you ascended to heaven, that you sit at the throne, that you've poured out your spirit upon us, Lord, I pray that as we contemplate this week, we come to know you better. That we celebrate everything that it means. That it forms us in our deepest hearts. That it prepares us for all you'd have us do. And that it pre prepares us for eternity in your presence. We thank you for that wondrous gift, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.